Um, one of my favorite, or not favorite, but most interesting times to me in American history uh, was the beginning of the last century, the beginning of the 20th century, and the movement uh, to create prohibition in America. I want you to think about this movement for a second. They succeeded in telling everybody you can't have beer. That seems like a tough sell. I mean, <laughs> they, you cannot have beer. And they won. They won. And when you read about the history of that movement, you have to have respect, just as I have respect for the religious right. And they're demographically some of the same people. But those folks got together, and they said, and the leader of the movement that got prohibition going, he was one of the first leaders that really engaged in grassroots activism in an effective way. And he said, you know, we're like the old ward healer bosses in Tammany Hall. We're going to control with a minority. Because the majority of Americans, I think they wanted to drink beer. But these people organized, and they would target districts. They didn't go to the non-persuadables, but they went to people who might be afraid of them. And they organized, and they said, you're going to vote with us, or we're going to bring our votes and our money against you. And they worked first state by state, and then they actually succeeded in doing something really counterintuitive to say you can't have beer because they were targeting and thinking strategically. And they were always a minority. They were never the majority of the citizens of the United States, but they were strategic. And the religious right in the early 1970s, they said, we're going to elect people to the school board. We're going to elect people to the town council. We're going to elect people to state legislatures. And where did we end up? We ended up with a president in a couple years ago who said to the president of France, that the way he was conducting foreign policy was specifically by quoting the book of Revelations. Now, I'm not saying there's a direct causation there to George W. Bush, but I think that he was the culmination of a 30 to 40 year movement. And if they can do it, we can do it. We have the advantage of being right. So, n number three, which I'll say is you. <laughs> uh, I'm concerned about uh, textbooks that teach science instead of religion and do not flinch at the idea of a revolution. And as I understand the situation, Texas is a big, big audience for textbooks. And right. So unless someone does something to strategically to change the perception that you buy a book, that uh, you publish the book, that Texas will buy, we're going to go on having uh, evolution regarded as sort of a crazy left-wing idea that has to be Right. You're right. And let me say, I'm somewhat proud to say, we just issued an action alert uh, from secular.org on this very issue. And there was some internal discussion about it because on one might say that it's a state issue. Uh, but I argued, and I think it's correct, that it is not a state issue. Um, it's a federal issue. And I want to just give you the whole context. Uh, first, as you noted regarding textbooks, the way it works is California and New York, two huge population states, they do not have, you do not have, and New York does not have rigid statewide textbook policy and standards. So in other words, from a publishing perspective, it's not a single unit marketplace. Texas rules statewide, and they're a huge population state. So they have taken the initiative where a handful of extreme religious right people make decisions that not only affect Texas, but the publishers react in such a way so that then it affects textbooks through many other states. And children's minds are, I think, uh, infected, if you will, with false teaching uh, far beyond the borders of Texas. Now, I hope we'd care, even if it was just Texas. The children in Texas deserve a fair education, too, but it goes well beyond the borders. And then, at the federal level, as I alluded to, uh, and it's very clear if you go back and look at No Child Left Behind, the history back you know, 10 years ago, or almost 10 years ago now, with No Child Left Behind, that the science education folks fought hard to get science included, and science was rejected. Uh, and you know, you can't, no one can show exactly why, or prove exactly why the Bush administration did or didn't do what it did. But even just a few weeks ago in the New York Times, they said, well, science and history, that's controversial. And in Texas, it sure is, because just to give you some specific examples, they had a list of leaders that changed governments in the world. Uh, and Thomas Jefferson was on the list. His name was removed from the list, uh, because he's the guy who said separation of church and state. Uh, they had language that talked about the consensus, the clear consensus among scientists about the origin of the universe being billions of years ago, they removed it. They just took it out. 
of the textbook. Uh, and certainly they inserted into the textbook false uh, questioning of the broad consensus that uh, evolution is sound. And so they've had national influence with a handful of people. So it's a very important federal issue. And we're going to be speaking out. And we're calling it equity. We're saying we're, we don't take a position about whether or not there should be national education standards. Some people may think there shouldn't be. But that's not our point. Our point is if you're going to have national education standards, and frankly, both Democrats and Republicans in Washington pretty much agreed that they're going to, uh, then we say those standards should apply to science and history, and they should be rigorous just as they apply to math and English. So we're speaking out, and I think it helps us to affect the perception. Um, I think I violated the order here. So whoever was number three, <laughs> I, you had your, there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you might have already answered it, though. Um, I remember hearing on uh, one of my podcasts that uh, isn't it already too late for textbooks because they already took out uh, Thomas Jefferson from uh, the curriculum and they replaced well, him with some other obscure president? Yeah, they just did. And is that the thing where they can't change it for another 10 years? Or something? No, um, there's still an opportunity to affect the process, and I think it's important for us to speak out. In fact, this Sunday, uh, there's a big rally in Austin, Texas. And if I were not speaking uh, in Southern California on Sunday, I'd be there. But there's going to be a big rally in Austin, Texas about this very issue. Then there's, you'll see it if you want to follow it on the internet, there's going to be hearings next week in, in Texas about this very question. Whether our side would win or not win, I can't really predict for you, but I know that we should speak out. So if you have friends in Texas, cousins in Texas, tell them to speak out and say, you know, we want strong educational standards for our students. Next, yeah, there we go. Yeah, and I mean, first off, I want to say I've been supporting Secular for over a year now, and I'm just glad you guys are there for an outlet for this. Oh, so you. thank you for that. And yeah. I hope other people will join me in there. But my question for you is, is 50 state stat strategy to get uh, California to have our own secular coalition for California? Mm -hmm. Are you looking at that as being a branch of the secular coalition? Or are you looking at that as being a separate entity as a party? It is a separate entity. We're actually talking about that now. We're having our June board meeting in California, as it turns out, um, and we'll be talking about it more. But I'll, I'll tell you the general outlines, which we've already agreed to. Is we're going to do, we're going to ramp up. We've done this to some degree already, but we're going to ramp up our grassroots training program. That's a meeting where you know I'll get together and talk with folks, like you know folks in this room, but w instead of a, a speech like I'm typically invited to. I or the legislative director at my office will sit down and talk about how do you approach a member of Congress? How do you talk to them about issues? What kind of papers do you provide? What is the way to get this done? Uh, for people who believe in secular values, it's a rather new thing. A lot, a lot of times folks are used to you know, going to a debate about whether creationism is right or Darwin is right, for example. And that's good, uh, but less used to this kind of uh, social action. So we would talk about how to do it. Uh, then as far as the structure, what we're talking about is really what I'd call an affiliation, uh, that we hope to be the catalyst for an organization. And obviously, California presents a special challenge just because it's so big and diverse. But that eventually, on their own, folks in California would say, OK, I'm a leader. Uh, I'm willing to help organize people around the state, make phone calls, do what needs to be done. And with a state this big, it's not like everybody's going to, at least not you know, regularly, meet all this, you know, in the same room, but that they would be networked uh, online in some way. And they would be statewide, non-theistic, and inclusive, uh, and, and advocates uh, on secular values. And then if they sort of met that standard, they would become, we'll call it an affiliate of Secular uh, Coalition for America. All right. What we want to make sure is that they're professional in their approach. They aren't you know, bomb throwing. They're going to be talking in an appropriate fashion. Well, I mean, sometimes people can get out there and say, you know, F you, or you know, there's, you know, that kind of approach. And that's not what we want. We want to show up and do it the right way when we advocate to elected officials. And uh, we think that's very critically important. And the other thing is this inclusiveness in sort of a statewide vision. Certainly for California, that's a big uh, project, bigger than it would be for Rhode Island. Or, but it's still, I think, a very worthy project uh, for this state. And I also think it can be helpful to the movement in, in an ancillary way, in the sense that I think some people say, ah, I've seen the debates, and I can watch the debates on YouTube. You know, So they don't come out to meetings, or they don't want to. 
But if you say, we're going to actually organize, we're going to set up a plan, and we're going to go talk to a legislator, I think you start getting people to say, yeah, I'll, I'll participate. I'll help out with that. Yeah, and, and you've mentioned those types of people so a few times, that they're out there. And how, how do we engage those people, like, like the soccer moms? I mean, how, how right. am I going to... Well, we hope to help with our communication plan so that when we talk about these kinds of issues that we hope get people a little bit more by the heartstrings, that you start to see more people. And we, we are seeing that, that when we project these issues out there, people go, yeah, thank you. That, you know, that gets me energized and excited. I met a woman, actually the leader for an organization in Rhode Island. Uh, his girlfriend or wife, whatever, came to a convention, and she kind of came because he was there. It wasn't her primary interest. But when we were talking about these kinds of issues, uh, she said, well, that really got me because the symbolic issues just, I agree, but they're not making me impassioned. This makes me impassioned. I'm willing to volunteer and organize and help. And, and that's, so it's part of the growth of the movement that's critically important. The other thing that you touched upon that I will mention is that Secular Coalition for America doesn't run for free. I've got four employees. I work full time in Washington. They work full time. It's, it's a big cost. And I will say that um, we did a bar graph in our January meeting of how much money is in the budget for the religious right and compared it to our budget at Secular Coalition. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and it was like, you couldn't even see ours, like a little sliver. And this is when I, you know, I increased the budget for our organization. So I'd ask your help. If you can help, uh, please either write a check or some people find it more convenient. You can go online and say, oh, I'm going to give you know, $25 a month to Secular Coalition for America, and you can have a real impact on our organization. You know, I'll tell you, whatever else you say about them, religious right folks, when they tithe, they tithe. They give money. They give real money, and it matters. It matters in terms of the influence, and, and we've got to make a decision. Do we care about it as much? And Secular Coalition for America, if you care about this grassroots effort, if you care about increased uh, communications plan, we're paying now for improving our website. It requires money, and we really could use folks who'd be willing to go online and say, yes, I'm signing up, or feel free to write a check tonight. Anyway. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see that chart bucks a month. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's making a lot more difference than it did in, in the past, that's for sure. Thank you. Uh, maybe I should do another count. Keep hands up who have questions. We're going to do one, two, and that's in there. Maybe everybody wants to go have a beer. <laughs> Uh, you, you referred to the fact that the religious right gave a lot of power by getting involved in small-scale government, school boards, town councils, yep. and things like that. Um, do you have any part of a plan that would help secular Americans do that or talk to people on those governments? Yeah. Because uh, a lot of what you've talked about is you know, sort of the big right. national and statewide issues, which um, certainly get more attention, but I'm wondering if we should be... I think we should. Their strategy to some extent. And, and I was glad to see, you know, that there are young people in the room here as well. So think about that they would run and have a career in elective office. You know, not everybody has to be president. It would be good if you could be president. But, you know, it's good to be involved in public service. And it's good to be involved in public service at your school board and your town council and to get involved and make that difference. I think the biggest thing we can do to help with